I laughed, I cried, it was better than Cats. I had a moment of like, go to the original material, Audrey, see what's happening here. And a few books that I had had, um, Hi everyone, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse. Today's video is going to be part two of what I read in December and I am so happy to say that I ended the year on a super high. Not every book I read in December was a super high, but I ended the year strong, happy, in a new series, life is good, rounded out the year at 100 books and I'm totally jazzed about it. So if you missed part one, I will link that all over the place so you guys can check out part one of what I read in December and let's just get into uh, part two. So as you guys saw in part one, I was reading a few nonfiction books, um, one of which had dragged over from November because I just was too busy writing to pay attention to reading. Um, I came off the wait list for Michelle Obama's Becoming and then as fate would have it, I came off the wait list for the audiobook of Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. And yes, I have the physical book, but I really wanted to listen to it. And I did, and it was fine. It was fine. And I feel like this is one of those books um, that people like either love it or don't. And I was somewhere in the middle. And this is like a um, inspiration for creatives, but probably more targeted towards writers. And Elizabeth Gilbert is the Elizabeth Gilbert of Eat, Pray, Love, which I haven't read and haven't seen. Um, mostly just because I have no interest in it. Like I have no feelings on it at all other than I'm just not interested in it. And this is the first book of hers that I had read and I had heard about it kind of in a whole bunch of different places. Cause again, it's like craft inspiration. And as a writer, um, I'm always looking for any place I can get some inspiration and coming off National Novel, Mar National Novel Writing Month, um, I was definitely feeling a little bit depleted and looking for a little bit of like that, get you back into the swing of things. So I would say there were definitely nuggets of this. I mean, I dog-eared a bunch of pages, so I don't want to make it sound like I didn't like it at all. I feel like the dog-earing never shows on here. So I listened to the book, followed along with it, dog-eared pages. There were some really good nuggets. There were some funny moments. There were parts I liked. Um, there were some parts that were like a little too out there, I would say for me. Um, not having read Eat, Pray, Love, she obviously references that because it was such a pivotal point in her career and obviously not one that she could have planned or expected. Um, interesting to hear about the aftermath of sort of life after writing that kind of a book. So I liked it. Like I said, there were nuggets in here. There were parts that I enjoyed. Um, it's a good, it's a good book about creativity. I wouldn't say it was life changing the way some other books, um, have been particularly, I talked about this earlier in the year. I reread Stephen King's on writing that book really spoke to me, but this is so super subjective. So I would say, if you're a creative person, if you're looking for some insight, um, if you're just looking for a good, quick read, listen about creativity, she narrates it, which is also super fun. Um, I think it's a worthwhile book. It just didn't completely like shift my access, so to speak, but I'm glad I read it. I'm glad I finally um, got to it. This has been on my shelf for a really, really, really long time. So yeah, so it was fine. It was totally fine. The next book I want to talk about, which was way more than fine. It made me laugh. It made me cry. I dog-eared it to death. I loved it. It was Ebby Drake Starts Over by Linda Holmes. And it's Ebby, rhymes with Chevy. I want to say like 30 pages in, she makes that super clear. And all the other times before this that I've talked about this book, I was calling her Evie and that's not right. And I loved this book. And the only reason I picked this up this came recommended to me in a Goodreads email because Taylor Jenkins Reid plugged it. And if you guys follow me, you know that I love Taylor Jenkins Reid. She could tell me to read anything. Like she could tell me to read a catalog. I think I said this is another one. She could tell me to read like an address on an envelope and I'm there. And I love this book. And this is contemporary. Um, I am in sort of, I shouldn't say I'm in this mode. I've always gravitated towards these books about sort of starting over, kind of being at 
a place in your life where you're not sure of the what next or you're feeling a little bit lost or you're looking for some sort of a sign or you're looking to start over or you're looking to kind of um, make a big shift in your life and whether you're in control of the situation or something happens in your life that forces you into that situation I just love these kinds of stories and all kind of inside flap kind of stuff so Evie I think she's like in her late 30s and her husband who was a doctor they live in a small town in Maine um, they were both born and bred there went away to college high school sweet sweethearts moved back in like the opening page of the book her husband has a heart attack and dies and we sort of fast forward a year and she is very much struggling and everyone assumes that she's grieving for her husband and she basically is like I'm gonna let people think that's what's going on and there's so much more going on behind the scenes with her and her best friend Andy who lives in town with her who is divorced dad of two he has a really good friend named Dean who happens to be a former pitcher for the New York Yankees baseball and he has a bad case of the yips and lost his pitch and has basically been run out of town and off the team and doesn't think he'll ever pitch again and just needs to get out of Dodge and away from it all and the limelight and the press and all the comments and all the criticism and everything. So Evie has an apartment in her house she needs to rent, Dean needs to get out of town, Andy hooks them up. And this is a year in the life of Dean and Evie and sort of all a great cast of surrounding characters as they both navigate really difficult things that are going on with their lives and navigate how to get through it when everyone outside of them basically thinks they know better than they do and how to tell them how to fix their problems like how to get over your husband and how to get over the fact that you can't pitch and they form this amazing friendship and it's just everything it's everything there's enough baseball in this that it satisfi satisfies all of my baseball love but not so much that if you're not a baseball fan that it's polarizing um they are they are funny they are imperfect they make mistakes they say and do a lot of the wrong things they're both really lost in trying to find their way they're um they're just i just i love the chemistry between them i love the banter i love sort of them trying to navigate the world kind of in a midlife i never thought i would be in this place and i don't know where to go from here kind of a way and i just I, I just loved it i loved everything about it i devoured this book i literally it like laugh out loud funny at certain points and 100 percent made me cry um it's been a long time since i've read that's a lie i've read a lot of good contemporaries this year um but i really just got lost in this and i just got lost in these characters and i'm so happy i picked it up this was like this was a completely random for me so how about that it's been a long time since i picked up a super random book um based on a whole lot of nothing other than a blind recommendation by an author I love and I fell in love with this book completely and couldn't recommend it more so if you're looking for a little bit of um, kind of feel good but like emotional and kind of tugs at you and relatable in a lot of ways and just solid writing solid storytelling some really terrific characters um, you literally cannot go wrong with this book the next book I picked up is in the hall with a knife by Diana Peter Frund. Peter Frund, sorry. Um, and this is the first book in a Clue mystery series. And it is like a modern day homage to the board game and like the characters' names and a lot of kind of winks to the movie Clue, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. And I was so excited about this book and I heard a lot of not so good reviews about this book and I read it and it wasn't that good. And I'm so bummed about it. But like every review I heard about it was pretty much dead on. And I would say out of the gate, before we get into it, if you are a diehard Clue fan, um, you might have a little bit of fun with this book. If you're not, you're <laughs> I probably would skip it all together. Um, so this is a group of students who are in a boarding school also in Maine just like my last book 
and it's basically like right before finals and there's a storm of Bruin and they evacuate the school but there's a handful of students and a couple faculty members who don't get out and they wind up basically being snowed in at the school and most of the characters are named after people from Clue. So you have Peacock and Scarlet and Green, um, Mrs. White, you have Mr. Body, who's the headmaster. And it's basically like a whole bunch of students who all don't like each other or have a twisted history with each other or there's some sort of rivalry going on. And there's a couple other additional characters who don't have Clue people names, but they're there because I guess they needed to have more characters. And they're all staying together in one of the dorms for safety. And they wake up one morning and one of them is dead. And very clearly, somebody who was there did the killing because there's no way in and there's no way out. So it becomes a very typical Clue locked room isolated mystery and had all the potential for all things great. And I just, I just didn't love it. I wanted to love it. I desperately wanted to love it. And I didn't, it just felt a little bit um, kind of predictable in some places, a little bit dry in some places. I wasn't riveted. I wasn't like edge of my seat. I was page flipping because I wanted to see what was going to happen next. It was an easy read, um, but it wasn't a particularly twisted mystery in any kind of way. And I won't give anything away, of course, because that's obnoxious, but I will say there was a trope in here that is one of my least favorite tropes that happened. And that just annoyed me, obviously, because it wasn't a trope that I love. And it felt like something just felt like a little bit too convenient, um, a little bit far-fetched, a little suspension of disbelief. And I can do all those things as long as the story is good. But this one was definitely a disappointment for me. So I felt like there could have been more clue stuff in it. And I don't know like how deep it was supposed to go with, um, Kind of paying tribute to clue and it's like it's supposed to be the first in a series so i don't really know where it's going to go from here um some things were tied up there is some sort of like ooh, this could happen next but i don't really know um where it's going to go from here and it's one of these books where like i think whenever it comes out i'll probably pick it up and i got this through um my library through hoopla um so i'll read it out of a curiosity but it's not like pulling at me so if you haven't watched the movie Clue, definitely watch that because that's pretty damn funny. <laughs> it's like, I feel like you can't go wrong with that. Um, I would watch the movie over this. And this is nothing like the movie. Like it's not a, you can watch the movie and not spoil for the book and vice versa. But if you're a Clue person or you've just never seen the movie, um, it's really, it's really pretty funny to watch. So yeah, just skip this book and just go watch the movie. The last three books I read this month are all interconnected, so I'm going to kind of talk about them in one lump sum. And I, you guys probably saw this maybe in a book outlet haul that I did. Um, I picked up A Study in Charlotte by Brittany Cavallaro. And this is a Charlotte Holmes, Jamie Watson. They are the great, great, great granddaughter and grandson of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, and they wind up meeting in a Connecticut boarding school. And this came across my radar and book outlet. I obviously bought it because I'm holding it, and I wanted to see what it was all about. But I had a moment of like, go to the original material, Audrey, see what's happening here. So what I did first is I listened to Arthur Conan Doyle's A Study in Scarlet, which is his first Holmes Watson mystery. And I have like slight familiarity with Sherlock Holmes. Um, for someone who loves mysteries and thrillers as much as I do, I should probably be more into this. No, I haven't watched Elementary. No, I haven't watched Sherlock. Everyone has recommended these things to me. They are both in queues on Hulu and um, Amazon or wherever the heck these shows are showing and I am gonna <laughs> start watching them. But I had, read Pound of the Baskervilles years ago. I obviously have some familiarity with this, but I've never actually read Sherlock Holmes. So I listened to Study in Scarlet and I enjoyed it. And what I would say is it was like a mystery in two parts and you see how Holmes and Watson meet 
they're on their first case, mysterious death, Whole, um, Sherlock Holmes is Sherlock Holmes with how he, the clues and how he puts the case together. And I just enjoyed it. It, it was, it was kind of like, to me, it was like reading an Agatha Christie. It was enjoyable. There was a big cast of characters. Um, you're not quite sure who done it. There's little clues peppered in. It was an easy listen in this case. Um, I enjoyed it. What I didn't like is, so at the end of part one, we find out who the murderer is. And then part two of this book is like, we flash back to the murderer's background and why they did the murdering. And we kind of get this whole, sorry, I keep hitting the tree, um, backstory that I kind of didn't really care about in the sense that it's told not through the murderer's perspective. So I felt like we get part one through Watson because he's, you know, keeps the journals and everything. And then part two was like this flashback. And then part three, we sort of have Holmes confronting the murderer and sort of the conclusion of the case. And then we hear from the murderer's perspective then. And I really wish if we had to have the part two that it would have been through the murderer's eyes because I just felt like disconnected from the story. And honestly, it was like a little weird. And I know it was like a really long time ago that the book was written, but it was a little bit weird to me. And that just threw me. I don't, like, I don't, I don't know what was happening there. <laughs> it was like, it's like if you're, you're reading and then there was none and then we know who the killer is and then we like hit pause on the story and then go back and then hear this whole backstory on the murderer and then we hit play again and then it's like the end of the book. So I found that to be a little bit peculiar. So not necessarily going to turn me off from Sherlock Holmes altogether, but I'm glad I read it. It was a classic. I felt like it like should be read, read it. We're good to go. Um, at the end of the day, this is not a retelling. It's just a play on the words of the title of it. So I could have fully read this without reading A Study in Scarlet, but spoiler alert. So I read um, Study in Charlotte, and then I read the second book in the series, The Last of August. This is my 99th and 100th book of 2020. These are the last books I read this year, and I am officially obsessed with these books. There's two more in the series. Um, I have a case for Jamie, which is book number three. And then book number four is a question for Holmes or a question of Holmes. Uh, I can't wait to get into them. I am toying with picking it up immediately, but I'm also thinking I should just take a break because I don't want to burn out and then sort of have nothing else to read in this series. But I'm going to talk about these a little bit in conjunction with each other in the sense that like, Holmes and Watson, so they meet, they're at a boarding school in Connecticut. Watson transfers there on a rugby scholarship from London. He has never met Charlotte Holmes before, but he knows the background of their families and how they connect and what their history is together. And he's read a ton about her and she is a well-known young detective. And like she solved her first case with Scotland Yard when she was like 11 years old. And he's fascinated by her and they wind up meeting they're in school together and somebody winds up getting murdered um pretty early on in the book and they wind up needing to solve the case because sort of immediately they are both believed to be the number one suspects in the murder so that brings them together and off we are kind of to the races and i loved it in so many ways i loved it because it was way darker than I thought it was going to be in all the best ways. And if you guys have watched my videos, you know I love a dark thriller. And Charlotte is complicated. She has a lot of baggage. There's a lot to her history and her family and her backstory that makes her who she is today. There is a wonderfully woven in rivalry with the Moriarty family. They've created this entire, um, family tree and everything as descendants of Watson and Professor Moriarty and um, Sherlock Holmes, which is just absolutely terrific. And I just love how complicated she is. I like how complex the relationships are. I like Watson trying to find his footing in so many ways, trying to be 
his great 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 grandfather to Holmes and then his father sort of teaching him how to be the Watson to the Holmes and in there's like this whole mystery meanwhile going on that is interesting and intricate and you're not quite sure who to trust and you're not quite sure who done it and it is at times violent it is at times hard hitting it is at times cringy but then it is like cringy in that like bad things are happening and horrible things are happening um but like good cringy but it's like ugh, like it's giving me anxiety kind of cringy and it is also funny and witty and just like incredibly smart and well done and there are throwbacks to Sherlock Holmes stories which to them are not stories it's reality but they explain the cases so even if you're not super familiar with Holmes like I'm not um they sort of explain the throwbacks and the winks to different cases so you can read this without having read those books but I just I love them both so much I I actually cried at least twice reading this book <laughs> which might say more about my state of mind than anything else um but they are like satisfying in and of themselves but both sort of leave you in a place of wanting more um again the characters are great just complex relationships um complex feelings dark characters i love watching their relationship build um it goes places i didn't think it would and again in a good way but i am just like literally super obsessed with these books and i'm so happy that i wound up picking them up because they are both tremendously great so that's going to do it for me for december for 2019 we are done put a pin in it 100 books i can't even believe it so many great ones um by the time this goes up i already will have put up at the very least my best thrillers of the year and probably my best of the rest all of them so you guys can check out everything i thought about um well not every book that i've read but you can check out what i thought of all the books i loved this year and then i also did a short list of books i didn't love because luckily um there weren't too many books that i didn't love but anyway great year so excited happy to end the year on such a high note i'm feeling all jazzed i can't wait to pick up my next book and yeah, I'm just feeling good about things. It's a great way to end everything. But I also wanted to thank everybody for listening, for tuning in, for watching, for commenting, for liking, for all of that good stuff. Um, I'm officially one full year on BookTube. It has been such a crazy year. Um, I think by now my goals video has also gone up. So I have huge aspirations for what I want to do in 2020 and just to get better and to do more of this and to keep on engaging with all of you guys. So thank you for watching today at any stage of the game. Thanks for being on this crazy journey with me. And I am very excited for all to come in 2020 books, booktube, everything. And I hope to see you guys in the next video um, when it goes up. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you again, and I'll see you soon. Bye.